But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Hello, I'm Chris Fowler, and welcome to Sports Century. During the NBA's first real surge of popularity back in the 1960s, Oscar Robertson compiled astonishing statistics that remain unmatched by any other player. But the game was different then, and so were the times. What has not changed is the memory of intolerance that still burns in the soul of the Big O, a player you had to see to believe. Oscar Robertson is the best basketball player I ever played against. I mean, he had no weakness. He was the Michael Jordan of his day, in a lot of ways. If Oscar were playing today uh, against Michael, we, we would have a huge argument going on. Everybody talks about Michael, and Michael certainly has a lot of style and stuff. But just flat out kicking ass, Oscar was a very potent weapon. Personally, that. When I look back in my career, he's the greatest player I ever played against, period. Oscar Robertson proved his greatness for all time when he averaged a triple-double, 31 points, 12 and a half rebounds, and 11 assists for the entire 1962 season. No other player has cleared that bar. He averaged a triple-double for a whole season. I can never compare to that. I really found out how good Oscar Robertson was when I was trying to accomplish the same feats as him. In many ways, what Magic did forced us to kind of look back and remember some of the amazing games that Oscar had. He was big, he was fast, he could pass, he could shoot, he could play defense. You watch Michael Jordan and he flies through the air. Uh, you watch Magic with no look passes. Oscar never did any of that. I don't think there was the kind of sense of appreciation for the fine things without any particular flair or pizzazz that Oscar was doing. The way I play because it's sick and so he's not doing anything to look at the score. Look at the assist, look at the rebound. People used to say, well, he did all he does is back his man in and score. Is that right? That's a shame. That's all you have to do is back him in and score. Why didn't everybody else do that? You knew where he was going to go. You knew exactly what he was going to do, but you couldn't stop him. That's greatness. It was hell, man, because he could just manipulate wherever he wanted to go. He didn't try to beat you with quickness. He just overwhelmed you, just methodically back you where he wanted to take you and just jump right over you. I used to say, you know, he's like an octopus with the ball. He's dribbling it. Look, he's got six hands holding people off, and at the same time, he's dribbling the ball. You never got the ball from him. Every game, you had this anger out. He was just such a machine. He'd just come up, clear out, and frown. You'd see that frown, you know, oh, God, here he goes. He would give his own players hell. He'd give the officials hell. I mean, he, he was out to win every night. And I, I like his competitive spirit. Oscar Robertson was a general in the best sense of the word, and the worst sense sometimes. Players were afraid of him. As much as they respected him, they were also afraid of him. I hated him because he kept yelling at me, give him the ball. <laughs> Get that ball back over here. Yeah, boom. Yes, sir. Yeah. Although Robertson's competitive fire was fueled by a complexity of grievances, his overwhelming discontent was being labeled with a black stereotype. Before I came on, they said, I said blacks couldn't dribble, couldn't handle a ball in the backcourt. Perception is that blacks are not smart, they're dumb, can't, get, can't think. They can play good, but they can't think. They felt like you're the point guard, you're the third base coach, a manager, a head coach in a football team. It took brains, and they didn't feel like we had those type of uh, necessities at that time. In Oscar's case, being the greatest basketball player at the time, they're saying, so what? That didn't mean anything. I still can't eat in a restaurant. I still got to sit in the balcony in a movie. I still got to sit at the back of the bus. Oscar was a very hard person to get to know. He, he was not a friendly person. I think a lot of black athletes at that time were naturally kind of put off by this white world. A lot of turmoil and that what he was going through, uh, he kept inside in the 50s and 60s because of fear. You had to hold a lot in in those days because organizations, especially in professional organizations, sports, they had control of you. They could have blackballed you, and that was the fear. Robertson had to decide what price he was willing to pay to be a great basketball player. I said, do you want to be to basketball what Jack Robertson was to baseball? Do you think you can take it? If you can't, it's all right. But do you think you can? He said, yes. I thought he was one of the greatest individuals in the world. And until I went through 
my years at Cincinnati, I couldn't really get, feel the magnitude of what he experienced. The advertisement, the press, the publicity, the public were looking for their heroes to be white, and Oscar just happened to be a great player. But his greatness was never fully appreciated in Cincinnati. For 10 long seasons, the Royals were mired in mediocrity, never reaching the NBA Finals. While in Boston, Senator Bill Russell was anointed an NBA immortal after winning nine titles in the 1960s. Bill Russell, he drew the attention, maybe more so than Oscar Robinson, because he was an owner winner. And people respect you when you own a winning ball club. The Celtics had a lot to do with that. I think his personality had a lot to do with it. Oscar was sort of, in my mind, a negative kind of a guy away from the basketball court. He said to me, there are three or four critics I'd still like to punch right in the nose. <laughs> okay, he didn't. It's still in his craw. You take a, a young man, grew up in the South, played in, in the all-black school, came to the University of Cincinnati, the first black to play, threatened by the Klan, told I couldn't do certain things. It's wonderful I didn't kill somebody. Born in Tennessee in 1938 and raised through adolescence in Indianapolis, Oscar Robertson suffered two brands of American racism, Northern and Southern. But common to both experiences was that universal deprivation known as poverty. A very poor family, never had a lot of money. Mother worked three jobs. I mean, they was, it was tough. I mean, they worked, their, you know, I mean, they tried the best they could try. Coming from rural Tennessee during that time, we pretty well understood what the racial situation was. In fact, when we were traveling in fourth, Many times uh, we would encounter restaurants that had separate quarters for minorities. When I used to go back to Tennessee on the bus. Mother would tell me where to sit and don't get off the bus. Couldn't go to the bathrooms along the way down those little towns down through Kentucky. But they still want you to ride the bus and give them the money. Robertson began playing basketball when he was eight. By the time he reached All Black Christmas Addicts High School in 1952, he was a prodigy. The basketball court was a haven for Oscar while he was at Christmas Addicts in a very nurturing environment. The problem with it came when you started taking this, what was nice in the game, into an integrated situation. Now something that brought you so much joy, all of a sudden was the object of a lot of uh, vitriol and hatred. There were a lot of calls, a lot of threats, that you know, if you play, this will happen to you and that will happen to you. It was hurtful. When I was a sophomore in 1954, it was difficult getting games from the other city schools. White schools didn't want all black teams beating them. One of the favorite words was nigger. What are you doing here in the first place? We don't want you here. I was called names and whatnot, so he didn't bother me. It's made me play harder. Oscar Robertson from the corner. Perfect. In 1955, Crispus Attucks became the first black high school to win the Indiana State Championship. Then, as if to prove it was no accident, they won it again the next year. In the summer of 1956, I was going into my junior year in high school, and I heard a local uh, high school coach sitting among some people say, boy, there is a hell of a player over in Indiana. His name is Oscar Robertson. Robertson's boyhood dream was to play for the Indiana Hoosiers, but that changed when he visited the Bloomington campus. I really wanted to go to Indiana bad. The branch were cracking was so nasty to me. He was a coach then, and I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go there for anything in the world. At the University of Cincinnati, Robertson was a three-time college player of the year while winning three scoring titles. Despite two trips to the Final Four, the Bearcats never reached the finals. Meanwhile, Oscar was receiving an education in what it meant to be a great black athlete in 1950s America. He opens up his locker to, you know, to change his clothes. They got a black cat in it. Psychologically, that beat you up. One of the bad things that I remember happening for Oscar being in Houston, Shamrock Hilton Hotel, we were staying there, and they would not let Oscar check into the Shamrock Hotel. We all wanted to go wherever Oscar was going to go. But the coach said, no, we'll, we'll take care of Oscar. We'll get Oscar set up. He was upset, and uh, I think he was on the verge of leaving. He was more upset with the, with the university because he felt that they knew that that was going to happen. I was never the same with my team team again. Not that it, it affected the relationship I had with certain, certain guys on the team, but I was never the same. In his junior season, Cincinnati was to play in the Dixie Classic in North Carolina. I got a letter from the Ku Klux Klan saying they were going to shoot me if I came to play in North Carolina. Robertson made the trip. The thick racial atmosphere that surrounded him finally exploded in a game against Wake Forest. Oscar was the best player in the country at the time. They were white down there, had no blacks on their team. They had resented Oscar's abilities, I'm sure they did. Sports writers were yelling and calling Oscar names that they wouldn't even want to talk about. It was hurtful to him. It was hurtful to me to see it. Most men would have said, hey, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to do this. But he stayed in there. He stayed in and he persevered. After graduating, Robertson won a gold medal at the 1960 Rome Olympics. He was the territorial draft choice of the hometown Royals and was expected to apply his Midas touch to the struggling franchise. 
but gold was not in the team's future. The fact that the Royals never got past the Celtics, never won the NBA championship, a lot of that is going to fall on Oscar because he was the leader. Oscar had the ball a lot. I think maybe that was one of the biggest criticisms of Oscar. I did hear the fact that, that Oscar did pound the ball a lot, did dribble a lot, but I think there were times when he had to do that to, to make things happen for the team. Who else was going to control it? Here you got, you got a guard who's all pro. Uh, I, I knew the game better than anybody. Who would have the ball? Robertson was about to suffer the unkindest cut of his career. Royals management would take the ball away from the Big O and give it to a proven winner. In May of 1969, the Royals hired Bob Cousy as their new head coach. The hope was that the former Celtic star could instill a winning attitude with an up-tempo style and more ball movement. It was a, a lot of enthusiasm in the beginning, but Bob Cousy's uh, egotistical nature rubbed the players the wrong way. And I think in Oscar's case, perhaps there was some jealousy. Bob Cousy and Oscar didn't speak to each other that often. And that, that amazed me a little bit. I mean, it seemed to be a respect for each other there, but it wasn't that coach to player, player to coach connection. There was a big gap between them, there's no doubt about it. Oscar was a sort of a coach on the floor you hear today. All of the other coaches before uh, Bob came in, let Oscar do it that way, you know. And uh, then when, when Cousy came in, he was going to change philosophy. It was never an ego thing. I could continue with, you know, simply letting Oscar get whatever number of points he wanted to get. He was still capable of doing that at the time. But in the long-range planning, this wasn't the way we wanted to go. Bob Cousy wanted to trade Oscar Robertson. What did Bob know about basketball that I didn't, that I didn't know? It was get Oscar Robertson out of Cincinnati at all costs. Well, Oscar had been a fixture in Cincinnati for so long, had been so successful that he resented it, and I don't, I don't blame him. 41 years old and retired now six years, Bob Cousy inserted himself into the lineup at point guard for seven games. The whole thing was kind of weird. When Bob Cousy activated himself, we, we all as a team maybe uh, in some way lost a little respect for him, and Oscar just gloated. There was some criticism in the press of Oscar by me, for one. We were disappointed he hadn't entered into the spirit of what Cousy wanted to do. I think we kind of felt that uh, he could have done more maybe to enter into that and try to salvage the franchise in some way. All of a sudden there was a campaign uh, about some writers said I hadn't done anything. I've made all pro every year, every year. Oscar, when you look back after all these years in Cincinnati, did you ever think the day would come that you would be traded from the Cincinnati Walls? Not prior to this past year, Jack. No, I didn't. I felt that I wanted to play out my tenure here in Cincinnati, but uh, this past year they have, they have a new organization to come to Cincinnati and they felt that and everything had to go. At the end of the season, the Royals had lost five more games in the preceding year. With virtually no goodwill between himself and the front office, Robertson agreed to a trade with Milwaukee to play alongside Lou Alcindor. Oscar uh, took this, uh, actually, I would say personally, uh, more than just a, an impersonal trade. He's a leader. He's got great confidence and ability. He gets the job done. And he's going to be a big asset to us. When we first acquired him, everybody says, how are you going to handle Oscar in Korean? They understood their roles, and Oscar was the orchestrator. And Jabbar was a devastator. The Bucks getting Oscar uh, was, a, was a brilliant, brilliant idea. A guy who really knew how to move the ball around, who knew how to exploit defenses, uh, who knew strategies. Early on in the season, Oscar realized that the pick and roll wasn't going to work with me and him because I did not have the bulk that Wayne Embry had had, but uh, that uh, it was very easy to get me the ball when I was moving. I told him Mike's going down. And the offense was for Kareem anyway. Oscar, being the uh, person that he was, kept Kareem in his place, just like he kept all the rest of us in our places. So, you know, uh, if Kareem was missing a defensive assignment, and his eyes would get about this big, and he let Kareem know. Big fella, fall in line. His scoring average down six points. Robertson was now calling the shots instead of taking them. Milwaukee was 66 and 16, and breezed through the 1971 NBA playoffs and into the finals against Baltimore. Kept away by Allen, Robertson controlling it. Here that lead pass to Denry. Robertson, he must have four or five eyes. The Bucks swept the Baltimore Bullets in four games. Oscar, congratulations. Thank you. Big, big win for you. How do you feel? Is this better than the days that you did? Oh, it's great. Great day. Finally, finally got it. Finally got it. It was worth all those bad days. All of the bad days getting up to that. That was the uh, tremendous payoff. That was a gold ring. After 10 years of frustration, Oscar Robertson had finally won his ring. But ultimate victory would not change the man within. I was getting on the elevator, and, uh, and there was Oscar, and he started crying. 
and uh, he was so caught up in the moment, and, and he was just shaking his head, and, his, and tears were coming out of his eyes, and he's all my life, Greg, I finally won the NBA title. Three years later, Oscar Robertson retired at age 35. For the league's all-time assist leader and second leading scorer, the parting seemed hollow and all too soon. I think Oscar always felt, at least later, unappreciated for what he gave to the game, because being in middle America, and yet somehow not embodying middle America in the way middle America would like to see itself, so therefore he could not be really codified properly for his impact to the game. I can understand why he's scarred. Your team, their success depends on you. And when they are successful, you don't get the credit you deserve. And when they are not successful, you get more blame than is deserved. But you cannot keep that in you. You have to let those things go. Letting go just wasn't part of Oscar's game. In the late 60s, when prominent black athletes were speaking out against racism, Oscar Robertson began working his own agenda. Oscar's mother had asked him to be a Jackie Robinson. All right, so what did he do? A guy who's not, never really known for making stands is the president of the NBA Players Association. In 1970, they filed suit. They took on the NBA. And basically what he did, he set in motion a suit that freed players. You know, Oscar wanted to carry that weight. And he did carry the weight. You know, but was he like Jackie? They're different people. I think Jackie Robinson is a very unique story. He's a very unique man. And it's just not fair to say to someone else, be Jackie Robinson. You can try to do some of the things, but you have to do it the way you want to do it, and it's comfortable for you to do it. He could have had Cincinnati in the palm of his hands, but he never let himself go to the point where uh, he was completely open, completely uh, relaxed. He always kept something back. Then, while speaking on the Cincinnati campus in 1994, when a statue of him was erected, Oscar finally did let go. I paved the way, but I was still naive. It has been said many times that God never puts more on you than you can handle. But believe me, you're tested often. We went to Houston. I didn't stay in the hotel with the team. The longest ride of my life coming back to the university. Sorry. They put a black cat in my, lock my locker room. In North Texas. The statue is Oscar Robertson, but it's for you. And you, and especially you. That's for everybody. He cares deeply about things and about people. Even though he gives an impression of being standoffish, he cares deeply. That was publicly seen in 1997 when he gave one of his kidneys to his oldest daughter, Tia, who suffers from lupus. I was shocked about that. I couldn't believe that someone from the hospital would let that out. Right after I come out of surgery, I thought there was some ethics about, about things like that. He sees the hospital as not reacting in the proper fashion to his daughter, perhaps. Did Oscar go home and sulk? Oscar gave a kidney. <laughs> He's just a great, great human being. A level of compassion and sensitivity that is as big as his basketball abilities were. It was praise I didn't deserve. I mean, you know, what's so big about a father doing something for his daughter? My brother internalizes things, and, and he carries it. If, uh, you have to really know him a long time, but I just think that loss of confidence, loss of trust that have made him the person that he is. You never forget. Never forget. Never forget anything that ever happened to me. There may be bitterness, or there may be a scar left, because certainly there were wounds. And at some point, you make a decision. Can I persevere, be compliant, but yet be my own man? Knowing and studying Big O's life as I have, there is an adamant refusal to be beaten into submission, to compromise in order to, uh, at some point in one's life, be at peace with the situation. I think that that is just not in him to do that. What will last even longer than Oscar Robertson's recalled slights are his achievements. Everyone is well aware that he averaged a triple-double back in 1962. But few know that he averaged a triple-double over the first five years of his NBA career. In 384 games, the Big O averaged 30 points, 10 rebounds, and 10 assists. For all of his greatness, Oscar Robertson remains just beyond our reach. His absence a shield against a past he can't bury and can't release. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.